As you may have heard me mention, this year marks the 40th anniversary of Tuck Everlasting, which is one of those amazing award-winning books that we all read in school and it kind of sticks with you and is definitely one of my favorite books. Not only from my school days, but one of my favorite middle grade books of all time. I think it's just brilliantly done. For those of you unfamiliar, I have left the full synopsis and links in the description, but it basically is a look at the ideas of mortality and immortality and dashes away some of the sparkle and carefree happiness of the idea of living forever. And for a book that's aimed at you know, nine and ten year olds, that's some pretty weighty stuff. That's pretty heavy territory to get into, the idea of mortality and of living forever and not wanting to live forever and what a toll that could take on a person. That's a lot to aim at that age group and to carry it off so well. For that reason alone, it's always been a favorite and I think that's one of the reasons that it's such an enduring classic. And so, in honor of its 40th birthday, that's what we're going to talk about today. And just to be warned, if you haven't read it, from here on out there might be spoilers. When I first read it as a kid, there's a sense of bittersweetness. I remember being both impressed with Winnie and feeling like she had made the right decision not to drink from the spring and not to choose to live forever, and yet at the same time really sad for her and feeling like maybe she made the wrong decision. Not only for herself, think of the things that she could have seen and the adventures she could have had, but mostly for the Tucks. She was kind of this breath of fresh air and possibility to them and specifically we have Jesse who wanted to marry her and wanted to be able to have a partner in this life and someone to kind of share his journey with him especially when it's such an endless one such a lonely one just by default to have someone there with you would make it a lot easier but for the Tucks as a whole I mean there is this sense that especially for Mr. Tuck He's glad she made the decision that she made, but at the same time you know that he's also kind of heartbroken. She was potentially a daughter to him, and though he wouldn't wish his fate on anyone, at the same time you know that he had also been kind of hoping that maybe she would make a foolish decision and he wouldn't have to lose her. And I think that kind of hits right at the crux of the idea of immortality, because it's never going to be perfect and the world is always going to change around you. So even though you can kind of tell yourself all of the good parts of it, I could live forever, I won't get sick, I won't get old, I won't die, injuries won't bother me, I can travel all around the world, I can meet all these new people and try all these new things, I could learn every language, I could read every book. At the same time, I'm going to lose all of those people that I meet. I'm going to watch the world change and crumble around me. I'll live through all the good, but I'll also live through all the wars, all the human atrocities, all of my own personal tragedy and heartbreak, and have no way out of that. I have no choice but to live it. I'm never gonna grow old. I'm never going to experience myself at an older age. Especially with this book, you're frozen not just physically at that age that you drank from the spring, but overall, I mean, Jesse drank it at 17 and stays a 17 year old, not just in looks, but he acts still like a 17 year old. So you're completely frozen in this moment of time and do you want to be who you are right at this moment forever while the world changes around you? And of course being immortal gives you no guarantee of a good life, of a happy life. The tucks are still struggling, struggling more so because you can't necessarily put down roots when people are going to notice that you don't change and are going to start to question that. You can't build a career because how do you even apply for a legitimate job as the world changes around you and it's harder and harder to live off the grid? The only way to do it is, is for you to not legally exist. And if you don't legally exist, how do you get a job? How do you save money so that you can travel the world? I mean, you're really going to be locked into living off the grid and subsiding by the skin of your teeth forever. Not for the rest of your life, but forever. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll figure out a way to set up false identities, which might be a nice sugar-coated way of saying stealing identities so that you can build a life. But if you're someone who finds that unsavory or wants to live a good life, you're probably locking yourself into living a difficult life. I think normally when we talk about the idea of living forever, 
we glamorize it because that's why we would want to live forever. We'd want to be able to experience things and do things that we don't think we're going to get to do in this lifetime. But then when we think about all of the hardships that we have in this lifetime to be carried out and multiplied over hundreds and thousands and who knows how many countless years, it loses its shine. It doesn't seem like it's the best course of action. And to have it happen accidentally, as in the case of the Tux, is even more tragic. And I think that's part of what makes it such a beautiful book and makes them so relatable and makes the choice so poignant and bittersweet for Winnie. I think for me personally, if there were a failsafe, if there was a way out, then it would be a no-brainer. You know, to be able to have all the time in the world, literally all the time in the world if I chose to, would be potentially amazing. And for a time would outweigh all of the sadness of an endless life. But at some point, the balance is going to tip in the other direction, and all of the new experiences and the shininess are going to be outweighed by the sadness and by the feeling of being lost in a world that keeps changing around you. I mean, look how much it's changed just in, in recent time, in one person's lifespan, how much the world has changed and how fast it's changing. I mean, it really is snowballing. And the further you get from your natural lifespan, the m more bizarre and strange that's going to become and the less you're going to recognize the world that you knew. And you won't have the option to get back to that. So eventually, it's going to sway in this direction of life being a burden. And you'd want to know that when it gets to that point, if you want out, there's a way out. And if there's not, I don't know how you could ever want to drink from the spring. You begin to really understand the Tucks, and Mr. Tuck especially, in wanting not just a life for Winnie, but wanting a death for Winnie, as strange as that sounds. Wanting her to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and not just a beginning. As I said, it's weighty stuff for a nine-year-old. And that's part of why I really respect Natalie Babbitt and any author who is willing to tackle this type of story for that age group and not talk down to them and not treat them like they're not capable of beginning to think about these things or, most importantly of anything for that age group, empathize. I think you can't learn empathy soon enough. I think that's part of why this has endured for 40 years and part of why it will continue to endure. So not to be uber serious and existential today, but it's just something interesting to think about and something that I do think about. You know, when you're having those like lazy summer days and you're just kind of sitting there and one thought leads to the next and you think about, if I lived forever, what would I do? I would learn every language I could possibly learn. I would tackle every art form, learn every skill that I could. When you think of the world's knowledge at your fingertips and all the time to learn it and experience it, then it seems almost a no-brainer, but there's always the balance, there's always the flip side of the coin, and forever becomes a much scarier, much sadder possibility. It's not all just learning languages and how to play the violin. And just because you're living forever doesn't mean that you can't be starving. It doesn't mean that you can't be depressed or lonely. The only difference is, it's forever. If you have all the paths open to you in the world, and yet still no choice, then I don't know if it's worth it. So yeah, not to be weirdly existential, but whatever. It's Tuck Everlasting, so we're going there. The beauty of the book is that I find myself, upon reading it now as an adult, at the same place that I found myself when I read it as a child. Wistful and bittersweet for Winnie and the Tucks and the choices that they have to make. So all these years later, it's still a book worth talking about. If you've read it, or even if you haven't, but just find the topic interesting, please weigh in in the comments. I'm curious to know if you would choose to drink from the spring, what you would do if you could live forever, and why you wouldn't drink from the spring if you would decide not to. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend you pick up a copy. The special edition for the 40th anniversary will be coming out soon, so you can get a fancy copy if you want. But even if it's an old, beat-up copy from the thrift store, Pick it up, read it, share it with a child in your life, discuss it, because it's very discussable and memorable. It's very quick, I mean, you can read it within an hour, and it's a story that will stay with you, and you don't get that with every book. 
And the only last thing that I want to say is think about all of those things that you would want to do, that long, long list you would make of things you would do if you could live forever, and then remember that there is no spring, there is no fountain of youth, there is no immortality for you to wait for and plan for and take advantage of. So look at that list and start doing them now. And serious moment. But that's all for today. I will see you guys again on Sunday for a video that I don't remember. What am I doing on Sunday? Oh, I will see you guys on Sunday for the first half of the January vlog. So I will see you guys then. Can't wait to chat with you in the comments. Thanks for watching, and as always, happy reading!